Hi there. Um, welcome back to the Maritime Business Veterinary Technician Online CE. Um, we're actually moving along um, with Laboratory Sciences, which is the third module, and we're in the section where we're going to be um, talking about microbiology, parasitology, and toxicology. Specifically, this lecture will be on parasitology. So um, some definitions that are important to understand when talking about parasitology, um, obviously parasitology itself is the study of organisms that live in or on other organisms. Okay, and the, a definitive host is the, is the host is the person or animal that harbors the adult parasite. Okay, the intermediate host harbors the immature parasite, not typically the adult parasite. They usually leave the intermediate host and make their way to the definitive host to mature into the adult. There's a reservoir host which harbors a parasite, but it's not affected by the parasite. Okay, so it's not typically the host that it wants, and it may harbor it, but it's not going to be affected by it. Then there's a parentinic host, which is um, an intermediate host in which no development of the parasite occurs occurs and then a vector which is an organism that transmits a pathogen or uh, to a host so important to understand this terminology the life cycle of a parasite, um, there's a simple with direct transmission. So um, some parasites are just going to go from the egg out of one host into the other host and just go ahead and that's going to, it's going to develop into an adult just that simply. And then there's a complex with one or more vectors and that's when intermediate hosts start playing a role. Parasite transmission between hosts is necessary for parasite survival, right? So they have to go from host to host to host, and that's how they multiply. Uh, requirements, they need um, a mode of entry into the host, um, and usually that has to be the parasite at the infective stage needs to be able to enter the host. Um, there has to be a host, right? Um, accommodating location and environment in hosts for maturation and reproduction and a mode of exit from the host into a suitable environment. So parasites have a negative impact on their host. They can, um, as they enter the patient, uh, they can cause injury. When they can migrate through the body, which can cause injury. They can just sit in their intestines, for example, and live there, which causes it, which may cause in injury. They can have chemical or psychological. They can cause chemical or psychological injuries as well as injuries due to a host reaction. This picture here is a cuta rebrae, and um, this worm or this parasite here burrows itself subcutaneously and uh, just lives there and it pokes his head out to come out and breathe and you have to pull it out and it's one of my least favorite parasites they're so gross but they're called cuterebrae so there's different categories of parasites okay so there's nematodes which are typically typically all of them are called are typically roundworms which just means if you cut them in half on cross-section they're round there's cestodes which happen to be tapeworms. There's trematodes, which are flukes, arthropods, which are ectoparasites, so they live on the outside of the host, and also protozoans, which are single-celled single organism, unlike all of the other categories. So let's go through these. So let's start with our nematodes. So a gastrointestinal nematode is called a round worm because on cross-section they are round. They will parasitize the widest assortment of wild and domestic species. They can affect many organs in different systems. And there's four different types of nematodes that we're going to talk about. Um, the Ascarid, Strongyloides, Trichuroidea, and Philoroidea. Okay, let's start, um, so sorry, before we move on to those categories, let's continue on with the anatomy of the nematode. So they have a cylindrical body and um, I, again, I'm not, the anatomy of this nematode is quite impressive actually, um, but um, mo mo most important to understand that upon cross-section, they're circular, they don't have respiratory systems. Um, they do have nervous system and excretory systems. They do have body cavities with digestive tracts and reproductive organs. And uh, there is separate sexes as well. There's a female and a male when it comes to nematodes. And um, all of these things are completely absent in the protozoans that we were talking about. Protozoans are single-celled organisms, so they don't have any of these reproductive systems and all of that. And that's what makes them different. So the nematode 
<clears throat> the life cycle of a nematode, um, it has a standard life cycle. So the developmental stages are the egg, there is four larval stages, and the sexual mature adult. So the infective stage, um, <clears throat> the egg containing a larva, free living larva or a larva with an intermediate host, um, the direct life cycle is there's no intermediate host and um, no intermediate host is needed for the development of the infective stage. And then the indirect life cycle where the intermediate host is needed. So we're going to talk about um, different nematodes and their life cycles. So once a nematode gains entry into a new host, the development may occur in the area of its final location or may occur after extensive migration throughout the body. Um, and that, that's where the damage can happen. <clears throat> Di diagnostic stages, most uh, found in feces, blood, sputum, or urine, and sometimes in the lungs, kidney, and urinary bladder in the heart. All right, so let's start with the very first one, which is the ascarid, um, the ascarid of a dog and a cat. So in practice, we refer to these ascarids as roundworm, even though the entire category of nematodes, um, or sorry, even though there's different types of nematodes that um, typically have that roundworm appearance. This ascarid is the one that we refer to as a roundworm. Toxicara canis and Toxicara cati and Toxicara leonina are the three species. They're found in the intestinal tract of the dog and cats all around the world. Um, all puppies and kittens should be examined for a large robust nematodes. Um, the adult ascarid can get to 3 to 18 centimeters in length. The prepatent period for Toxicara canis is 21 to 35 days, so that's upon ingestion how long it's going to take before it actually starts reproducing and laying its own eggs. <clears throat> if the egg is ingested by a transporter or parentinic host, this is an atypical host that will not support the growth of the parasite to develop into an infective adult. For example, if we get to if a human gets Toxicara canis, which is for dogs, we're the parentinic host. We're kind of like the accidental host, right? So the egg can um, actually insist in that host until the definitive host eats that parentinic host, okay? So um, obviously we're not going to get eaten by dogs, but let's say this was a mouse. The, to the mouse gets Toxicara canis. It's going to insist in that mouse. It get the mouse gets eaten by a dog, um, and then the dog will get it that way. Humans, like I said, can become parentinic hosts as well, and uh, these worms um, can insist themselves as well as the larvae may migrate. So you can get visceral larval migrants and ocular larval migrants. So the larvae will um, migrate through your viscera, which is just organs, um, and as well make their way up to the eye, causing blindness. So a lot of damage is done with these guys um, in accidental hosts. <clears throat> so, um, clinical signs of Toxicara canis, so the dog roundworm, is um, puppies that have a pop belly, just like this poor little guy over here, um, vomiting, diarrhea, and may have delayed growth. In adults, um, there's, there's not that many clinical signs, but they may have diarrhea, but a lot of the time they tend to be asymptomatic. Toxicara cati, they're typically asymptomatic when kittens have them, but some may have diarrhea and a pot belly and they may be dehydrated depending on the um, how heavy the infestation is. And adult cats are usually asymptomatic as well. All puppies and kittens should be assumed to have roundworm due to transplacental and transmammary transmission. So it's very important to deworm all puppies and kittens. And um, a lot of the times these roundworms can insist themselves in the definitive host as well. So the dog and the cat can have the worm insist itself. And it'll stay there for years until um, a stressful situation comes along, for example, pregnancy. And... Um, they will come out of their little cyst and make their way to the intestines and start their cycle. So, um, and then this can be transmitted transmammary and transplacental as well. So it's, it's assumed that all puppies and kittens have it. So it's very important to deworm them. Um, 
these are common ascarids affecting domestic animals. The first one is Toxicara canis. This is what you would see on a fecal flotation. The second one is Toxicara leonina. Um, and then the fourth one is Toxicara cati, which are the three most common ones that we talked about. But they all typically have the same appearance on your fecal flotation. They tend to have a very thick outer shell and then a very circular inside. And there's some videos there to help you out with their life cycle. So Bayless ascaris is mainly found in small uh, in the small intestine of raccoons, which are the definitive host, but they can also be found in dogs. Um, it's similar to ascarids of dogs and cats. It's diagnosed using routine fecal flotation. So it's typically termed as raccoon roundworm, okay, and um, very dangerous. The larva can actually migrate to the brain tissue and cause damage. So if you happen to be a parentinic host or an accidental host, that raccoon roundworm larvae can actually migrate through your body and actually go to your brain causing major major damage it it's you know it is rare but it's very serious and i and there are documented cases every year of these um these raccoon roundworms causing neurologic issues in children um and the children and are more susceptible because they're immunocompromised but uh one of the other reasons one of many reasons why raccoons shouldn't be kept as pets Strongyloides, um, typically we call it hookworm, okay, and it lives in the small intestine. There are three different kinds, or there's five different kinds listed here. Typically, Ancelostoma uh, uncinaria are the two most common types of hookworm that we're going to see in clinic. Hookworms are found throughout the world and are common in tropical and subtropical areas of North America. <clears throat> so these guys cannot, if they do get into our dogs and cats, they actually feed off of the blood. So they cause anemia in our puppies and kittens. So very important to take care of these guys if ever they're present. The eggs are oval or um, ellipsoid with a thin wall as opposed to our roundworm eggs that had a very thick wall, right? And um, the eggs larvate rapidly in external environments and um, we need fresh feces to diagnosis and you can find it on a standard fecal flotation and that's what you would see there. They have the, the lobed kind of inside ova there and a very thin outer membrane. And this is a video to help you out with the life cycle of the hookworm. We have trichoroidea. Um, in practice, we refer to this as whipworm. And uh, it's found in the cecum and in the colon. And canine whip whipworm is trichurus vulpus, which is the most common. And then we have feline hookworm, rare North America and diagnosed sporadically around the world. Um, but typically it's trichurus vulpus. The adults have a thin filamentous cranial end and a thick caudal end that kind of whip around. And uh, the eggs are thick yellow brown symmetrical shell with polar plugs at both ends. So you can see the plugs in the egg that you can see up here. This is what you would see on your fecal flotation. And um, I'm pretty sure it's called operculated. The egg is operculated. So it has these polar plugs at each end. And that is your whipworm. Um, there is um, different types of um, whipworm that you can find in raw or undercooked pork. Very important to uh, never eat that undercooked because these larvae may make their way inside your body and they can insist within your muscles or migrate throughout your viscera. So very dangerous. And here's a video to help you out with the whipworm life cycle. Filaroidia, um, this is heartworm, okay? Um, the, the species that we're going to talk about is Dirofilaria imitis. It's the mo most important parasite of the vasculatory system in domestic animals and more specifically in the United States because um, the prevalence there is higher, although in Canada it is growing. So the less it's less common in Canada but found occasionally in dogs. Primarily Ontario and Quebec have the highest incidence of heartworm, but it is increasing in other areas areas in New Brunswick there was a case reported I do believe last year so um, definitely growing up here in Canada <clears throat> also known to parasitize cats and ferrets it's not just dogs that it will affect 
the adult heartworm, it actually um, lives in the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery and the fine branches um, of the arteries as well. So you can imagine how that plugging up the ventricle and your pulmonary artery, how that would affect the circulation and uh, can be recovered from other sites like the brain, right? So they, they may migrate as well. The prepatent, is six, the prepatent period is six months. So once infected with the worm, you're not going to have um, symptoms. You're not going to show up positive on a test, nor will those um, worms be adults that are laying eggs until six months after infection. So how to diagnose feline heartworm? Uh, you can do a blood smear, just like you can see at the top right picture here when we're doing a manual differential. We'll see the um, microfilaria in the blood smear because remember that that blood sample was collected from the peripheral circulation and that's where the microfilaria are hanging out. And so, um, and so you can see it that way. There's also something called the modified knot test. There's commercially available filter techniques and immunodiagnostic tests like what you can see down here at the bottom right where uh, it's an IDEX snap test specifically in this picture and you take a blood sample and put it there and it will tell you whether your heart whether the patient's heartworm positive or not this is a website to help you out with the heartworm life cycle so as a summary for the nematodes, the life cycle of a nematode consists of several developmental stages, the egg, four larval stages, and the sexually mature adult. The infective stages of the ne nematode may involve an egg containing a larva, a free living larva, or a larvae with an intermediate host. Um, direct lifestyles have no intermediate hosts. Indirect lifestyles require an intermediate host. Transmission of nematode parasites to a new definitive host occurs through ingestion, skin penetration, and that's that hookworm. When you're walking on the nice sandy beach and you step on a hookworm larvae, they can actually penetrate the bottom of your feet and make their way up that uh, subcutaneously. It's, it's, from what I understand, quite itchy and painful and uh, disgusting. Um, also, ingestion of the intermediate host or a deposit on the skin by the intermediate host can cause a transmission. Nematode parasites of veterinary significance are in 11 superfamilies, and the most common nematode parasite of dogs and cats are Toxicara, uh, Ancelostoma, Trichurus, and Diarofilaria imitis. Toxicara being the roundworm, Ancelostoma being the hookworm, Trichurus vulpis whipworm, and Diarofilaria is the heartworm.